Hello, good evening. I very much hope I am broadcasting live into the Organic Education Facebook page. My name is Alice Kimasia. Hopefully a few of you will tune in and join me live. While I'm waiting, I'm just going to practice sharing my screen because I am hoping this evening to be able to do that. Have a little play. Oh, yes, that seems to work. So let's stop that for a moment. I think many of you have been joining me on these monthly lives, but if you're new this evening, hello, welcome. Good to see you. My name's Alice. I have four sons who are now aged 20, nearly next week, 18, um, 15 and nine. And my husband, Krish, and I have been home educating unschooling them for ooh, over a decade now. He's a secondary maths teacher. And um, you can catch these lives monthly through this year here on my Facebook page. If you're with me tonight, do say hello in the chat. Um, it's always good to know that there are people out there listening. But of course, you can always watch these lives on catch up by scrolling down my page. Oh, hi, Fadzai. Thank you. Nice to know somebody's out there. Better than talking into the ether to myself. So thank you. Yeah, and do um, put comments in the chat, questions. You can share your own experiences there and um, encourage one another from your own home educating journeys. So it's always nice to have a little bit of interaction going on there. Tonight, I decided I'm going to share with you a workshop that I've given a number of times over recent years um, called Mentoring Self-Directed Learners. Um, and my aim is to kind of give you a toolkit to help you to facilitate um, this alternative child-led approach to learning in your family. And I've got some slides to go with this workshop. So tonight, technology pending, I'm going to try and share my screen with you and um, it'll make a change from you all just looking at me. <laughs> so let's begin. I can't actually see on my screen if there are other people joining you, Fadzai, at the moment. Oh, yeah, there are a few people listening in. Fantastic. Do say hi in the chat and we know who's with us. But let me see if I share my screen, if you guys can see it, because that would be a good start, wouldn't it? Let's have a look. Can you see that? Fadzai is talking to me, so perhaps you could just let me know, Fadzai, if you can see it. And hopefully me just little in the corner. So mentoring self-directed learners, how do we encourage and facilitate our children's learning so that they become self-directed learners as they grow? Well, there are two children, actually, who made me an unschooler who turned me into a believer in autonomous learning, child-directed learning, de delight-directed learning. And the first child is, is me. This is me um, in the middle of my selectively mute years. I think I'm probably about six here. Selective mutism, a complex childhood anxiety disorder characterized by a child's inability to speak and communicate effectively in select social settings such as school. These children are able to speak and communicate in settings where they are comfortable, secure and relaxed. I struggled with school-related anxiety. Clearly it was not a place I felt particularly comfortable, secure and relaxed. And at times as I grew, I was a school refuser. And I've always known that school is not the best learning environment for many children and maybe you're watching and you have an anxious child like I was a child who's perhaps sensitive to sensory overload maybe a child who's simply an introvert and finds school overwhelming and if so I really want to encourage you this evening there can be education that looks very different that promotes feelings of safety and well-being and is based on trust and relieves anxiety. And the second child, 
who changed my approach to learning, the way I think about learning. Oops. See if I can work the technology there. Oops. No, go back one, Alice. Oh, it's not that easy to operate. There we go. Look. <laughs> Was my firstborn son. This is Elias, who's now almost 20. And he turned everything I thought I knew about parenting, education and learning upside down. He taught me to trust him and to follow his lead as he persistently and doggedly pursued his own path and calling in his own unique way. And despite my natural tendency to steer and worry and control, he persisted and at times he fought me until I learned to get out of the way and to support and facilitate and cheer him on as I saw him grow into the young engineer that he always sought to be. He, my Elias, is one of the quirky ones, one who didn't fit into the boxes, who hates to follow instructions. And his brothers and I are thankful for the lessons that he taught me. I parent better for trusting more. I hope you can see these pictures all right. Maybe you have a child like my Elias. Maybe you feel the weight of responsibility. They don't fit the standard model and you're wondering how you're ever going to teach them anything. They just won't listen. Maybe you worry you won't be enough. You won't have the knowledge, the expertise. Maybe you encounter a lot of conflict between you when your child resists everything that you might try to encourage them to do. Maybe you feel a bit of despair that your home isn't exuding the joy that you long for. And maybe, maybe this approach to learning will suit your child, your situation. Maybe there'll be something here for you, the parents of the quirky ones, the out of the box, non-conformist, inquisitive ones who buzz with energy and possibility. I do hope so. Oops, lost the slides now. Let's stop sharing and then I'll try again. <laughs> I'm not that brilliant with technology, so it's always a bit of a push. I don't even really like being here live, so I'm pushing myself out to my edges, really, doing these. But I, I'm hoping that whatever your situation, um, there'll be something here tonight to help you to facilitate self-directed autonomous learning at home. Um, so let's explore some of the... Um, approaches that inspire this kind of pedagogy. Um, I don't know if many of you have heard of um, Malaguchi, Loris Malaguchi, but he was an early childhood educator who with a group of inspired parents founded the pedagogy known as the Reggio Emilia approach. And this has been a great inspiration to me over many years. It was a movement that was pioneered in a community in northern Italy at the end of the Second World War, in response to all that had happened, it was a kickback against fascism. And the women of Reggio Emilia wanted a preschool to provide a new form of education that would ensure their children would not tolerate injustice and inequality. And it's inspiring to think of alternative education like this as a parent-led resistance movement and to believe that the way we raise our children can change the world. So through a Reggio lens, children are seen very much as active constructors of knowledge rather than being a target of instruction. Reggio involves not only teachers as facilitators of children's learning, but children working together as active inquirers, apprentices, researchers. And the Reggio approach also recognises the importance of the community of which children are a part. And this emphasis on relationships, on belonging is important and important for us to remember as home educators too. 
Can you still see these slides? Hope so. Oops. <laughs> Hi, Kerry. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Hope you're all right. There we go. Brené Brown, I'm sure many of us enjoy the work of Brené Brown, who said, the opposite of belonging is fitting in. And that really got me thinking, because fitting in is hard work, isn't it? And belonging is effortless. So we want to create homes and spaces and communities where people can truly belong as their authentic selves. Thanks, Vadzai. So in summary, the Reggio philosophy is based upon these, um, these principles. It's giving children some control over the direction of their learning. This doesn't mean you have to give them full control of their learning all the time, especially when you're starting out um, on this different path. But it's that sense of being able to direct their own learning and to make their own decisions, at least some of the time, which is important. And children learn in different ways and they need to be able to touch things and to listen and to move around and to observe their environment. And children must be allowed to explore relationships with the world around them and with other children. And projects provide opportunities to explore and observe and hypothesize and question and discuss to clarify their understanding. And I love this last point, children must have endless ways and opportunities to express themselves because we're all different. And there are so many ways in which we understand and respond and express ourselves. And I often wonder how my youngest son would cope in school because he's always on the move and he kind of processes his understanding by expressing what he hears in movement. And especially when he's really thinking, he kind of jumps around and moves a lot. Um, and there's a poem by Loris Malaguchi, which you can Google if you're interested, called A Hundred Languages. And it's about the different ways um, a child thinks and speaks and understands. A hundred worlds to discover a hundred worlds to invent, a hundred worlds to dream. He said, children show us they know how to walk along the path to understanding. Once children are helped to perceive themselves as authors or inventors, once they are helped to discover the pleasure of inquiry, their motivation and interest explode. And when I took my boys out of school, this was my vision. It can be tempting, can't it? Especially when we first venture out on this road less travelled. But at any time when our doubts start to run high, um, to look around for a curriculum, um, which will be the answer to all our problems. And it can be really tempting to spend a lot of money too on resources and things. But what I've been trying to do over the past decade or more is to find a way of learning that starts with our children, that starts with our own families, with our experiences, with our locality and the world that we encounter together day by day, forging our own path of autonomous learning. And it's easy to look at, you know, you might look at people who are a bit further down the path or those of us who do these lives online or speak out and do workshops and think, that we have it all together. And please don't think that of me. Um, when I started writing about home education oh, about 12 years ago, my blog was called Organic Education, A Journey Into Autonomous Learning. And that is what it is ongoing. Even now, 12 years on, it is a journey. And our thinking and our insight develops along the way from child to child as we work with different children and from season to season. And the unschooling happens in us. 
in the parents. And this is the way that it has to be. It takes time. And it means that, well, the nature of the journey means that no two families experience of this type of learning will look the same. And that, of course, is the beauty of it. But it's also perhaps the frustration because you can't replicate what I am doing or what somebody else is doing because my children, of course, are different from yours. And this is learning tailored to your children and to your family and to your situation. So Reggio Emilia is a philosophy of early years education, but it's unusual to find it taken forward as children move into formal schooling. And in my experience, what it grows to look most like is, is project based learning. And this book by Laurie Pickett remains one of my favourite kind of manuals for home education. Um, and project based learning combines children's interests with long term deep, complex learning. It's an essential experience for children to spend time working on something that matters to them with the support of a dedicated mentor. And project-based learning doesn't have to happen all the time, but you might want to consider giving some time in your week over to this kind of learning. Project-based learning is an approach to learning that prioritises doing real, meaningful work. And that work um, meets certain criteria, right? So it must be self-chosen. It grows out of your child's genuine interests. The child's unique viewpoint and curiosity determine the path that the project takes. The child controls where the project goes. It's self-directed. So if you as the parent are doing the planning and making the choices, then what you have is some kind of unit study, but not really a project in the way that I'm talking about it here. Um, because the objective with project-based learning is to give your child the chance to direct and manage their own learning. So they decide what they want to do and how they want to do it. And you are very much a facilitator and mentor along that path. So it must be self-managed. Your child sets their own goals and measures their own progress. They start to identify and solve their own problems. And you have to stay out of the way so that your child can step forward and do that. And this can be really challenging for adults, especially if we feel that it's our job to teach our children. So remember that it's a journey and we can take small steps as we move towards a more autonomous approach. Um, I remember I was fortunate enough um, a while ago to hear Michael Morpurgo speak, the children's author, and he's such a wonderful storyteller. Um, and it was so moving and inspiring to listen to him. And he said, and I noted it down at the time because I agreed with it, we underestimate children in our society. Children will rise up to the level at which we present to them. Don't patronise. And this is so key. I think we all could probably give examples of adults in our society patronising children. And so I think that this kind of learning that I'm talking about begins with recognising just what our young, keep, our young people are actually capable of. And their knowledge and um, their interest will often surprise us with its depth and application. And too often children's capacities are quite drastically underestimated or simply not recognised. Um, and I just wanted to tell you, I just these are just a few inspiring stories of ch things that children have done and achieved. Um, this is 13 year old Kylie Simons, who after her own battle with cancer, invented a backpack um, that gives kids like her an alternative to clunky IV poles. Oops, lost my pictures. Let's try and rectify that. 
Uh, I've got a new laptop as well, so trying to figure out the tech is sometimes a little bit of a challenge for me. But here we go. Hopefully that's back and you should be able to see. Oh, no, it's not going to work. If we don't have slides, it doesn't really matter because I can still talk. But it's nice if you can see pictures because it makes it a little bit more interesting. Let's try it one more time. Uh, it might be better. Yeah. Can you see that? Ten-year-old Bishop Curry. Now, he was inspired by the death of a young child in his neighbourhood to invent a gadget that could save the lives of children left in hot cars. Um, this is 15-year-old Suman Mulumudi, who's the son of a cardiologist, and he designed and 3D printed a smartphone case which enables a patient to monitor their heart sounds using their phone and transmit them to a physician remotely. Because <laughs> I've got lots of pictures on that particular slide, it's decided not to cooperate with me. Let's see. Should keep it more simple, shouldn't I? <laughs> now, you might have read the book or seen the film, The Boy Who Harnessed the Wind. Has anyone seen that? It's worth it if you haven't. Um, if so, you'll have heard the story of William Kamkwamba, the, inv the innovative teenage engineer featured in that in that book and film, who constructed a windmill to provide his village in Malawi with water and electricity. And of course, Greta Thunberg from Sweden is just one of many inspiring young climate activists across the world who made headlines with her school strike for the climate and inspired a wave of continuing global youth strikes demanding action on reducing our use of fossil fuels and Greta kind of channeled her great sadness at the damage being done to our natural world by starting um, a campaign which then sparked by social media continues to give voice to the concerns of a generation. Diagnosed interestingly with selective mutism, Asperger's syndrome, ADHD, Greta talks about how her different perspective on the world has become her strength. So you can see with stories like these, right, they illustrate that driven by their own interest and passion and with access to modern technologies, who knows where our children's learning might take them. And as their mentors, we don't need to be the experts on every subject, but Rather, we should expect our children to run ahead of us and to discover more than we know. And we lift them up onto our shoulders and inspire their curiosity, supporting their learning, amplifying their voices so that they can see further than we can. Um, and some of you might be familiar with um, a widely accepted theory of human motivation called self-determination theory, which proposes that people have three innate needs. Autonomy, that is having control over one's actions. Competence, which is building mastery. And relatedness, that is connecting positively with other people. And when these needs are fulfilled, the theory says people are empowered to act with intrinsic motivation, which means they'll start to do things, even very challenging things, for their own sake. But when these needs are not fulfilled, people no longer want to do things for their own sake. And extrinsic motivation then becomes necessary to motivate them to take action. And much modern um, parenting advice is based on the idea of extrinsic motivation, right? Rewards and punishments, carrots and sticks, coercion, um, and such, in string, such extrinsic motivation is um, clearly also fundamental to modern schooling. It has to be, right? Grades, um, detentions, merit marks, house points, exclusions, 
are necessary because school does so little to fulfill students' basic needs for autonomy, competence and relatedness. So by giving our children choices and helping them develop real skills and enabling genuine connection with others, we build an alternative education which results in intrinsic motivation and and the empowerment to live a life free from manipulation. Um, And people often say to me, well, how do you get your children to do anything? I can't even get my kids to do their homework. But if we are building learning around our children's interests, then we're kind of going with the natural flow rather than struggling to fight against it. So I want to give you some examples of long term project based learning in our family. Some of these might be familiar to you if you've if you followed me for a while, but they're good examples anyway. So let's look at Elias, my eldest son, who was always interested in machines. Um, Some of you might have seen Elias guested with me here on um, a live a few months ago, and you can rewatch that live if you want to by scrolling down my page. Um, But growing up, his preferred activities included vehicles, construction toys, connects, Lego, Lego Technic, taking things apart, welding, 3D printing as he got a bit older. Um, And at 13, his focus was very much on understanding cars and engines. So when my mum's car failed its MOT, she gave it to him and his project was to dismantle this car and remove the engine. And in the process, he learned a lot about the way cars work, mostly by using YouTube um, and car documentaries, as well as the vehicle that he had in front of him, to the point that he was able to fix uh, a problem with the radiator in our car and the exhaust on a friend's car, which obviously came in handy, saving us expensive trips to the garage. Um, But after being mostly autonomously home educated, Elias opted to go to a university technical college for young engineers for year 10. And he was swiftly recruited to their F1 in schools team of four students. Um, He became the design engineer and the youngest member of that team. And after winning the regional competition, they competed at the finals in in, um, Silverstone, where they were crowned national UK champions. And they then went to Malaysia to compete in the world finals. And for six months prior to going to Kuala Lumpur, this young self-taught engineer worked single-mindedly on their racing car using CAD, 3D printing, the latest titanium technology. He he got to work with engineers from local firms and from our two local universities. And it was a brilliant piece of project-based learning. And really, it was what kept Elias motivated in school through his GCSE years, because all the time he had his sights set on one prize. He wanted to win fastest car in the world at those world finals in Kuala Lumpur. And what is awesome for me about this is seeing him succeed in the area that he had been passionate about for so long and to see the way that this kind of ongoing project based learning motivates and engages his enthusiasm, his hard work, his commitment. And since then, I've seen him speak to roomfuls of experienced engineers about his work, and I'm astounded at the knowledge and skills that he has acquired and he's just in his element and is now in an apprenticeship um, at WMG on the University of Warwick campus where he's involved in research and development at the heart of that innovative engineering environment and this not just because of exam results you know but because of his self-directed project-based learning skills um, and the impressive portfolio that that resulted in And I've noticed deep interests are those that resurface and are sustained over long periods of time. You know, that's true in my own life as well. Um, And as a child revisits those interests, their knowledge, their understanding deepens as they mature. Um, A very different 
um, area of long standing interest is my is Noah, my third son's um, obsession with tennis. Um, and again, there was a live. Noah came on live with me um, a couple of months ago, um, which you can rewatch if you're interested. Um, but sport, you know, sport in itself can develop many skills. Noah plays at a local tennis club where he's built up a circle of friends and plays almost daily. He trains in two weekly squads. I kind of joke that the, the, the club's his second home. He spends so much time there. Um, but now he's he's being encouraged to help coach the younger squads, um, which he loves and is now starting to be paid for. And he's good at including and encouraging others to join in. Um, he even motivated me to get a kind of home ed club going for um, for tennis um, and a mum's one alongside. So even I was starting to play. Um, and it shouldn't surprise us that our children's interests are really different from our own because we're all unique people, right? Um, so, you know, remember that as mentors, we don't need to be the expert on everything, but we can help find others who share our children's interests in our community. And often folks are only too glad to share their skills with um, an enthusiastic young person. But apart from playing, Noah does a lot of other things inspired by his tennis interests. He came to understand percentages, for example, from um, watching the first and second serves in by percentage. Um, he is, he's enjoyed making graphs and charts of the top players' achievements. Um, he's written extensively at the computer about Andy Murray's career and talk, he's talked about maybe becoming a sports journalist. Um, he can impersonate all the top tennis players with great humour um, and has started several YouTube channels and more recently a podcast, the Breakpoint mm -hmm. podcast, to share his love of the sport with a wider audience. Um, he's read books about Wimbledon and about Andy Murray and other players and sports personalities, rather meteor autobiographies. Um, he started a little business at his tennis club where he sold his homemade cookies and brownies, um, which got him a, a, the club's Entrepreneur of the Year award. Um, and as part of a community arts project, he became very aware of Andy Murray's efforts to speak up um, on behalf of female players in sport and admires him as a feminist. Um, and Andy Murray became a great role model in our home. And through my son's love of tennis, I've learned to love it too. Um We've, we managed to get to several tournaments where Noah was able to watch his favourite players and even get a few autographs, including a scribble from Andy Murray himself. But I think the highlight for him was being able to share his Andy Murray impression with Andy Murray's mum, Judy, at Edgebaston, which was quite amusing. Um, it, and it's easy, isn't it? It's really easy to be very busy in our home education and to spend a lot of time and a lot of money on trips and visits, which can be entertaining and can be great. Um, but if we can focus trips um, and outings on our children's current interests, then their value and the learning gleaned from such a trip will be multiplied um, a hundredfold. back to me for a minute while I try and sort out the slides. Let's have a look. There we go. So um, project work is often undertaken um, as a whole family exercise. Um, we might focus on one child's interest and all join in with that for a bit and go, you know, Follow, then follow another child's interests. Um, and they the projects might also be undertaken with others. And ideas kind of cross-pollinate in community as one inspires another. And children learn so much from one another, especially when children of different ages are able to collaborate together on project work. Um, and one of our most successful collaborative projects was an, environment, an, an environmental group, which began with the question, what happens to our rubbish? And took us on a learning adventure that I never could have planned for and I didn't expect. Um, and my learning in that was as rich as the children's. 
um, and took us from a tour of our local rubbish dump all the way to the Houses of Parliament um, and continues to inspire us in trying to reduce our use of plastic, um, led to our involvement in local youth strikes for climate, as well as a more recent performative action in our city where children led an intergenerational exchange of love, gratitude and grief for our planet. Um, and that was certainly a, an, an ongoing interest of mine. Um, so that was a lovely thing to um, engage with alongside the children. Um, and you might think your, your child doesn't have any interests like this. Well, my child doesn't have interests like this, you might say. But it's worth really taking the time to think about any past or present interests that your child has or has had. Um, and you really might surprise yourself when you get thinking with what you come up with. Don't discount interests that you yourself are not naturally inclined towards. Just allow them to flow and really think about what your child's focus is on. Um, their interests might not be your interests and vice versa. And that's OK. But you can also... Um, you know, do this exercise for yourself as well. What are your interests? What interests have you had over the years? Perhaps there are some that you parked when you were young for whatever reason. Maybe those things weren't as valued as other pursuits. And so you just parked it and it might be something that you could think about picking back up. Um, so I don't know if any immediately come to mind, pop them in the chat, but Take some time, because this is one of the fundamental things about this way of learning, is to look and really focus on what, um, what our children are interested in. Fadzai said in the chat there, my son found book learning very challenging. We discovered that he understood sport well. Yeah, right? So you're looking at what is your child interested in? What's a key? What's something you can build learning upon? Um, so, yeah, um, it's an important think kind of starting point um and it's interesting how what our children actually are interested in can easily pass us by because we're so busy with our own agendas or we're we're focused on what we think they ought to be doing um and it, this really is the, the starting point for learning in this way this week for example my youngest son this week is interested in all things spooky and he wants to host a spooky night for his friends um and it would be very easy for me to discount this or just kind of push it aside. You know, it's 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 a hassle. I don't really want to do that. Um, but if but if we can say yes, if we can go with it and then think about all the potential learning that might unfold in in planning that and in organizing things. Um, and you know, you can you can then embark on this learning adventure together. Um I haven't quite worked out, have I, how to smoothly move the slides on. Let's have a look. So, yeah, I, I, I want to give you four tools this evening, really, which can help you to become an effective mentor, nurturing self-directed learning. And so following on from what I've just said, the first most important tool is it, perhaps a gift that this period of lockdown entrusted to us, which is to slow down, to listen, to observe. Um, and journaling is one way that you can record um, your child's learning. Um, and it's a habit that you can implement and you can practice. Um, and we'll, I'll look a little bit at some ways that you might do that um but it, it doesn't need to be complicated right so you could start by just trying to write down um two things each day perhaps one thing in the morning one thing in the afternoon something your child asked about or a game they were playing something that they were talking about something that grabbed their attention and over several days perhaps a week you might begin to see themes emerging and you pick an interest you know to feed and to nurture and over time, you get better at identifying and feeding interests that have the potential to develop into deeper projects. Um, but I'm, I'm really not talking about anything that's difficult to do or to see. Um, for example, I observed my youngest son talking a lot about wizards, drawing wizards, and he 
um, his interest was then quite focused on The Hobbit and he'd heard his brothers talking about it and he wanted to read the book. Um, so we listened to the audio book on car journeys and he was hooked and he found um, a graphic version of The Hobbit that one of his older brothers had enjoyed. And we dug out some old Lego sets that we had that he could rebuild. Um, and he enjoyed writing out the names of all the dwarves and drawing them. Um, I remember we made a Gandalf birthday cake at his request. We visited the Tolkien Trail at Sareholm Mill in Birmingham, which he loved. And he's since gone on, you know, to listen to the whole Lord of the Rings on audio. Um, and we even had a short breakaway recently at a Hobbit house to fuel his, his kind of storyteller imagination. And you can see the way that something begins to it's like going down a rabbit hole, right? And you, you start going on this learning journey and it takes you round sort of twists and turns. You're not quite sure which way it's gonna go, but it's exciting. Um, and it starts by observing, observing where your child's focus and interests lie. Um, you might use a notebook, you know, to keep a note of, of things they say or things they're interested in. Um, you might find digital tools. Like at one point I was using Evernote, um, which is like a, a digital notebook, um, find what works for you. You know, you might jot, doodle, add pictures, photographs. Most of us have a phone with us nowadays. So, you know, it's easy to perhaps just take a quick picture to remind yourself. Um, and it gets easier over time until it's all, it almost becomes automatic. Um, and you, you have this kind of running agenda of current interest in your head. But it is a habit worth implementing and and practicing and journaling is kind of like the data for this kind of learning, right? So there's not really a shortcut. It's like mastering a habit, observe, 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 listen, 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 and, and then document what you see, note it down. And then you've got these kind of field notes, right? Your journal is like the field notes, um, the raw data from which you can draw out potential projects. And your journal reminds you and enables you to feed back to your child their own ideas as you work to become an effective mentor. Fadso has got something else there. It took a long time for us to find his interest as he finds it challenging to explain what he is interested in. We did this by giving him lots of different experiences until we found the ones he enjoyed and understood. Yeah, that's brilliant, Fadso. And that persistence on your part, you know, and, and being willing to just take the time and engage with with your son um, and really to see what he was responding to is so valuable. Um, I wanted to share with you. Oops, lost the thing again, haven't I? Oh, no, I haven't. <laughs> it looks different on my screen. <laughs> Have a look. I wanted to share with you um, a tool that I have um, adopted from my work with Julia Black, the Lights On Mum, which is the use of a learning carousel. Um, and, you know, this is brilliant. Um, and, you know, Julia's Lights On framework is, is fantastic um, and very much aligned to the way that we've always done our home education. Um, but the learning carousel involves setting up different stations which invite different types of exploration. Um, so you might have an engineering station with connects, Lego, perhaps things to take apart and some tools. You might have a digital station with um, an iPad and creative apps, items useful for animation. Um, you might have a writing station, which far from just including writing materials, might include puppets and audio resources and pictures and a jar of writing invitations. Um, you might have a makery with resources for crafting and creating things like a glue gun, plenty of felt and toilet rolls. You could have a music station. You could have a baking station, um, an athletic station. You, it's like laying out a feast, right, of different invitations and then watching and seeing in which direction your child tends to gravitate. And this gives you real insight into what switches your child on and lights them up. And then that informs the way that you enable them to access any project or learning opportunity. 
So my eldest son, Elias, always clearly had an engineering switch. But using um, a learning carousel, I discovered my youngest son is a storyteller. He loves making. He loves characterization, drawing characters, animating. He's also a bit of a digital wizard. And so combining those switches um, with his interest in imaginary worlds, as his mentor, I begin to see how I can support him in learning in a way which he will find motivating. Um, so we're going with the natural flow, right? As I said earlier, rather than struggling to fight against it. Um, so yeah, journaling, observing. And then the next important tool to work on is your environment. Um, and this is about creating a supportive workspace. So in Reggio Emilia philosophy, the environment is known as the third teacher. Um, so important is it considered in inspiring learning. Um, and the environment can also reflect back a child's work, reminding them of interests that they've been pursuing and celebrating and valuing their learning. Um, and you don't have to have loads of space or lots of beautiful expensive equipment what you do need to do is to look at the space that you have appraisingly and think about whether it speaks of the type of learning you want to see um now i had a room right that i designated as a learning space and i envisioned working in there all together it'd be lovely um and I took a picture of it when it was all new and clean and tidy, which makes it look really amazing, right? And it looks like it looked like that. And it didn't work out at all as I had planned it. Um, so here's some pictures of it in use over the years. But um, the older boys tended to use that back room with their friends still do um and if they were working on their own projects and so they each had their own kind of corner or desk area um so different so different and they had ownership for that that space and so you know Elias's area was a kind of mess of tools and engine parts um and general junk that was useful for constructing things and inventing things at one stage it became a bike workshop reflecting his passion for mountain biking um, and his friends would bring their bikes and they would take them all apart um, and my second son's area was much more digital with his tech wear sort of neatly arranged um, and more recently he set up his corner as a music production area and Noah's corner has been a bit of an art studio and is currently a sort of podcast studio and the environment changes all the time to reflect current interests and the boys have ownership for it um but one of the biggest issues with it is that it was at the end of our garden right bit of a walk down the garden through the cold and when it's raining through the wet and you know generally children especially younger children like to be near you so this is another thing to bear in mind um where are you expecting your children to work and I found actually most of my youngest son's learning happens um, in the heart of our home, which is in the kitchen, really in the dining area. And so I found I needed to rearrange that space and to move a lot of his resources into that area. Um, I made sure that the art supplies were there um, and brushes and paint pots could easily then be washed up at the sink um, and spills were wiped easily. Um, and less is more, right? So too much and the amount of stuff is just overwhelming. Um, you can rotate what's on offer. Um, you can hone things right down to the things that you use most often. There was one stage where watercolour and Lego, that was what was important in our family. So those things then need to be visible and accessible. Think about... Um, the resources you want your children to use, can they be got out easily? Can they easily be put away? This encourages our children's independence. Try to think about your space from a child's viewpoint. Keep it, you know, fresh, tidy, organised, inviting. Come to it regularly. Um, 
sometimes you might want to create like a specialist area if you've got a particular focus. Um, Elias particularly wanted um, like a tool store um, and a workbench area because he was often busy working in wood and metal and it doesn't have to be a large space. Um, it could, you know, a corner of the shed um, he had with a little workbench. Um, if you want to grow vegetables, for example, can a corner of the garden or a window box be provided over which a child can take ownership um, and remember, you know, rather than expensive toys, loose parts are wonderful invitations to creativity. Some of my youngest son's favourite playthings are mirrors, bottles, corks, um, and there are lists of loose parts materials conducive to open-ended creative play available online, including by searching on my Facebook page. Um so think about your learning environment at home. Can you think of changes that you could make to encourage the kinds of work you, that you and your child want to enjoy together? It's really worth taking the time to explore and discuss as a family. Um, and of course, it's important to consider the inner learning environment to that is our child's um, mindset or attitude to learning, their determination and willingness to engage, to push through resistance, to persevere. If we're pushing against inner resistance, then it seems like whatever we do, we, we get nowhere. Um, and we all know that picking our moment can be important. Um, there's no point expecting a child to engage when they're tired or hungry um but be you know beyond those basic needs there are times in our lives when we all go through challenges in terms of our own motivation um and the inner environment can throw up plenty of learning on its own so encouraging open discussion in your family around how you feel about learning how we fail well um how we overcome challenges how we grow and develop our brains um these th these conversations help us all to become more resilient learners. Um, yeah, so the third tool is about building family culture that supports your core values and goals. Um, and in order to do that, we have to identify what our core values and goals are. And then we orientate our choices and behaviour accordingly. Um, what is most important to us? What do we most want to do with our life together? Um, and some of you will have heard this analogy before, particularly if you follow my page. Um, but the rocks and the pebbles and the sand do all fit inside the jar. But if we put the sand in first, there's not much room for the pebbles, let alone the rocks. And the rocks are our priorities. These are the things we want to make sure we put into the jar first. And then we put the pebbles, which are perhaps also a bit less important, but we want them in there. And then there's still room for the sand to trickle in all around. Um, and if we've got those rocks in place, we won't worry so much about the sand. So a rock might be a really simple concept such as respect, which we want to be a foundational value in our home or music, or reading good books together, or spending time outside every day. This is really unique and personal to you and your family. But unless we lead and ensure that the priorities which reflect our goals and values and the family culture we want to build are built into our days, the sand will soon trickle in and fill our lives. And I think that's when we can then become frustrated or feel like things are a bit out of control or it's not looking the way we want it to. Um, and I find this is a particularly helpful way to think about screen time, both our own and our children's screen time. Um, so it's a really useful analogy just to keep in your minds. We can, with our children, build the making habit and nurture this kind of culture of creativity. It's kind of, it's about moving from 
consuming to creating. Um, and it doesn't really matter what it is, you know, whether it's cooking, art, building, sewing, writing, designing, programming. Um, when we take something that we have consumed, a cooking program, an art exhibition, a good book, a YouTube channel, and instead of just continuing to consume, we begin to create, to own it for ourselves, to make our own contribution, then we're building the making habit. And so I might model this when I look at beautiful crochet patterns on Pinterest, but then I move beyond just looking to going and choosing wool and crocheting a blanket for myself. Or when I move from reading blogs about home education to writing my own. Or our children might be inspired by YouTubers to publish their own vlogs. Or they might begin to draw their own manga comics or get experimental in the kitchen and it might look messy and it might feel disorganized and be chaotic but if you observe closely what is going on you will see the making habit becoming a central part of your family culture so there's a few kind of things that you can take away and reflect upon that you know it, it's it will take more time than we have here together this evening um, but I'd really encourage you to write down three important goals or values for your family and think about the idea of those rocks and pebbles and sand and reflect on how much time you devote to these things. Are there things you want to begin putting in to your daily routine to ensure that you are living according to those priorities? And I'd also encourage you to think ahead, you know, think ahead five, then 10 years and write down some statements about what you want your family to look like. Because if we don't think about the end goal, where we want to end up, then it can be difficult to set goals and priorities that will take us in the right direction. And continuing to hold those goals and values before us can be helpful when we find that our own motivation is waning or when we're having wobbles or feeling uncertain, we can be reminded of why we started on our journey and where we're aiming to get to. Um, and the third idea is um, to consider this unfinished statement. My family, how would you complete the sentence? And does the current reality differ from what you want your family to look like and to stand for? How can you define your family culture? Um, and you're really welcome to share in the chat if you've got immediate things that come to mind, but it's something to really consider and hone later in discussion with other members of your family as you think about how you can work towards being um, the family that you, you want to be. Um, I know that, you know, I always wanted my sons to be independent, self-directed learners. And, um, you know, sometimes when I'm too inclined to jump in and to try and um, control things a bit, I remember that. I remember it. And I, it helps me to then step back and to think, no, hang on. He's figuring it out. And I can see that. And I need to just keep holding back a bit. Um, so, you know, these these things can help us in the moment they remind us of what we're actually aiming for um yeah so the fourth tool i'm aware we've our hour is almost up isn't it and this is always a bit of an intense hour this workshop but i hope it's helpful um the fourth tool in the toolkit is about leveling up um and it's it's kind of about making small changes which then lead to meaningful escalation so don't feel overwhelmed. Don't feel afraid to start. Just start somewhere and just go one small step, one small change at a time. Say yes more often. Do less so that your child can do more. Don't do for them something that they can do for themselves. Can they write the list of materials they need and go to the shop? Can they plan the field trip? and make the arrangements. As much as they can do for themselves, let them do. Um, 
Yeah, and I kind of alluded a little bit to this earlier, but, you know, if you want your child to have more time to spend on meaningful pursuits, then you might want to clear your schedule of some of the less beneficial activities um, and the few ran the fewer random activities you do, the more time you have for personally relevant activities. Um, and it's really ma- it's really worth making time for learning and living that is rich, that is complex that is full of potential. Um, Encourage your child to dig in deep where their interests lie and don't be afraid to tackle difficult questions together because learning how to learn, how to pursue our questions, our challenges, how to make choices, how to manage risk, that's what it's all about, right? The more, the, the process is more important than the answers and we can model this, we can lead by example to enable our children to show up and have a go because the best way to raise active engaged learners is to be an active engaged learner um and really i think the greatest treasure of home education is quality conversation enjoyed in relationship and this above all else is what sets it apart from institutionalized learning. The conversations you and your children enjoy each and every day, the topics discussed, the level of engagement, the personalized nature of your discussions is really important. Don't underestimate it. Appreciate and enjoy the moment, the curiosity, the presence of your children, because believe me, although the days feel long, the years are short. So remember to be kind to yourselves. Um, You know, give yourself beautiful spaces in your home to nurture the creative person that you are. This is your learning journey too. So enjoy it. And people always say, well, what piece of advice would you give to those just starting out? And it would be to relax. And when I was starting out, people said the same thing to me but it's so easy isn't it to worry too much and to feel overwhelmed and to lose our joy beneath the burden of our responsibility and whichever path we choose to follow it will not be without its ups and downs so find encouragement find some supportive community and if that doesn't exist near you build it and then your child will learn to do the same Over the years, I've been involved in several collaborative learning ventures, which have brought new joys and many challenges, but they're important for creating the community element, which is so important in Reggio Pedagogy. And being able to work consistently alongside and to share our learning journey with a small community of like-minded families is enriching for the children involved and for the parents too because we all bring to such groups our differing passions and interests and gifts to share. And if we can build communities which reflect the diversity of our multicultural society and contribute to the building of bridges rather than walls, then all the better. Uh, Let me see if I can share that last slide. Pressures on school children are ever more intense. So embrace the freedom that this style of learning offers and take hold of the fact that learning can be joyful and inspiring. It can celebrate so many nuances of human intelligence. And by taking just one small step at a time, you can do it. You will learn more at your child's side than you ever learned in school. And so I want to thank you for joining me this evening. I've gone just over my hour, for which I apologise. But I hope this session has inspired you to perhaps take small steps towards more autonomous learning in your home. And I want to thank to some of the people who've um, been engaging with me on my page. I've had um, messages this month, which has been really lovely, particularly um, Naomi and Josie, thank you for your questions. 
Um, and I'm really sorry. I've had such a crazy month this month that I just haven't got the opportunity to respond um, yet, but I will. Um, and it's just really nice to hear from you and to have the engagement. Um, this month I've had, I started my MA. Um, we had Noah's Art GCSE exam going on, which was busy. Um, we had a little break in Yorkshire. We've had illness. And I've had this performative climate action that I've been really quite heavily involved in. So it's just been a bit of a manic few weeks. But um, I think things are settling down a little bit now. So, um, yeah, thank you, Fadzai. Thanks for being on the chat there. Um, and I hope a few more of you joined me live and, and benefited. But if you're watching on the catch up, then do comment with any questions. And um, it's always really good to hear from you. And I'll look forward to seeing you next month when I've got a special guest who I'm really hoping um, will be with us uh, here on the live. And then it will just be the December live, which I'm thinking perhaps um, I might just do a QA and a if people have questions that they'd like me to address. We could do a Q&A session, couldn't we? Let me know if you think that's a good idea on my page. Um, but until next month, I will love you and leave you. Take care. Bye-bye.